Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. I love it as we enter the Advent season, the coming of our Lord, which is what Advent means. It means the coming. And indeed, He is coming again. We look forward to that. The first time fulfilled with the babe in the manger, that He might come and redeem us from our sins by His blood on the cross and His resurrection from the tomb. Coming in humility. The next time he comes in power and great glory. We look forward to that and we look forward to him writing all the things, making them right, that is. R I G H T, not W R I T E. Making right all the things that are currently wrong here on earth. He will do it. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to that passage that we read a few moments ago. And we get to part three today of the Jews as God's people. Is the church Israel? Major question, and as you know, a number of weeks ago we looked at that historically all the way back to about 180 AD and how this argument has been going on throughout the history of the church. It's not something that's brand new. It's merely an old heresy that has raised its ugly head again. And as one of the commentators wrote, whom we quoted every time, this replacement theology raises its head, anti-Semitism raises its head, and the Jews have to run for cover. It's not what the Word of God teaches. So two weeks ago, uh, we were looking at the Jews as God people, part two. Last Sunday, of course, was Thanksgiving Sunday, a song of Thanksgiving out of Psalm 95. But the two verses in particular that we are looking at are the promises that God makes in verses 7 and 8 of the text that we read this morning. I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, and I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it. And God is not, as if I can be not quite politically correct for a moment, an Indian giver. I did swear to give it, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. He doesn't give and take it away. And I will give it to you for an heritage, and he seals it with his own name. I am the Lord. Gracious Father, as we look into your word again today, we pray that you will help us to understand the passages that are so badly abused in modern replacement theology, passages in the New Testament which teach the exact opposite of what the replacement theologians want us to believe they teach. Help us to see them in their context. Help us to balance Scripture with Scripture. Help us to understand the true hermeneutics of Scripture so that we might be able to answer and give a reasonable answer to every man that asks us a reason for the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. We thank you, Father, for your word and its power, and we pray that it will go forth now during this hour to the glory of Jesus Christ, your Son, the one who made these promises to Israel. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in our study of the covenant of the land, which we spent 13 weeks doing, we gave extensive biblical support for a promised future for a literal national Israel from the Bible, not from developing historical theology. We emphasize that the final touchstone is scripture, not what developed in the course of political and theological study. We began our study of the question, is Israel a church, by starting to look at all the references to the term Israel in the New Testament, and that's where we were last time we were together on this subject, looking at what does the New Testament say, and how does the New Testament use the term Israel. And we saw that most of those references are in the writings of Paul. We began with Romans 9, 6, which is one of the big texts used by the replacement theologians. Romans 9, 6 says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. And we noted, and very importantly so, we noted that this text does not say that the church is Israel, or that Israel is the church. The church is not mentioned in this verse. What it does is it excludes unbelieving Jews from those who are the true Israel of God. And that's Paul's argument, as we saw throughout the entire chapter. We went all the way, in fact, it's probably the highest, fastest flight over Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 that you've ever had in your life, because uh, I went through three chapters. That's amazing for me. Went through three chapters in one Sunday, Romans 9, 10, and 11, but picked up the highlights. We focused in on key issues, the bomb points, 
that need to be dropped in that chapter so that we would see what was the target of the chapter. And we can see that this verse is taken totally out of the context. Always look at the context of any proof text to see if it is being used in the way that the author intended. I'm going to give you a couple of illustrations. One is a make-believe illustration. One is a true illustration. Let me give you the make-believe illustration first so that you can understand why this is so important. The make-believe illustration. Can you imagine a sign over the entrance of a colony that claimed to be a Christian nudist colony? <laughs> now you say, that's a contradiction in terms. You're right. But hey, these people, they claim to be basing their practice squarely on a command of the New Testament. They're a Bible-believing Christian nudist colony. Only the Bible for our final authority. In fact, they have this Bible verse from the New Testament inscribed on a sign in large letters over the door. It comes from 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of putting on of apparel. <laughs> mm. Of course, they conveniently left out a couple of other things and totally ignored the context. Yeah. What they left out was, let it not be the outward adorning of plating of the hair or of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. You say, well, it still says that in there, all right. But now look at the context. What do the verses around this verse say? The context emphasizes that true Christian beauty comes from developing a Christ-like character. The context is emphasizing Christian modesty, which is definitely not the case in a nudist colony. You know, when you twist scripture to stick something in that's not there or pull a text out to prove something that really isn't in the text, you will also violate the very important biblical principle of interpretation, which is scripture interprets scripture. Remember that. Scripture interprets scripture. Not merely the immediate context, but you will find that the extended scripture also supports exactly what that particular text of scripture has to say. In this case, obviously, it does not. Instead, it violates another principle of scripture, if you took that verse out of its context, which is turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Aselgia is the Greek word. That is means totally, utter, shameless immorality. Saying, well, let us sin that grace may abound. Paul says, what? Shall we say that? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, other scriptures must interpret the passage that you're looking at, as well as the immediate context of that passage. Don't pick and choose a few words here and there to try to prove a point. You cannot do that. Because when you do, you turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. And it goes on and says, and deny the only Lord God that bought them. And it's talking about the apostates who do that. Which, by the way, a lot of gymnastics have been thrown at that particular verse by those who want to say that Christ died only for the elect. We know that he died for the elect, but the scripture doesn't say he died only for the elect because in that passage it says that the blood of Jesus actually bought the apostates too, those who are guaranteed of ending up in hell. Oh, dear people, take it as a whole. Don't take it out of context. Take them all as a whole. Don't take them out of context. So what we need to do as we look at Scripture is we need to find a balance between those who are antinomian, totally against all law, and those who are lascivious, who say that grace teaches you can sin. The Scripture teaches a balance. Balancing the Christian life is a very important thing to do because otherwise Satan will take you one way that you didn't think you wanted to go because you think you're avoiding the opposite extreme. Or if you tend to be more toward the other direction, he'll take you that way and avoid this. And you can't stay on the balancing wire if you do either of them. Total antinomianism over on one side, which says, hey, we can throw off all restraints. We can do what we want to do because we're under grace, not under law. And you end up in sin. Or you say, well, I know that those guys are wrong, so man, I'm going to stick to the law. I'll stick to the law. i just hold it tight, and that's all I, I'll think about is the law. And very soon you wear yourself out because you can't keep the law. 
and you be like the Pharisees who condemned even Jesus himself. Dear people, neither of those extremes is the Christian life. It is not the Christian life. There is a balance that God has given to us, empowered by the Spirit of God, motivated not by Mount Sinai, but motivated by our love for Christ who loved us first. You will do things for love that you will never do for law. You will keep yourself from things that are evil because of love, whereas there may not be any law against it. We're moving into a society now where sodomy is becoming a norm, it's becoming legal and so on. Listen, if you love Christ, you don't get into that. A man who loves his wife will not get into immorality and adultery. It's not because the law says thou shalt not commit adultery. It's because of love. He loves his wife. And that's why he doesn't do that. People, let your motivation be love for Christ. Not merely a list of rules. Oh, the law has a purpose. It was designed as a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. The law shows us what God's standard is, and it tells us we can't keep it. But it's to lead you to Christ, and suddenly you have a whole new relationship. Suddenly you have a whole new motivation. Suddenly you realize that you've entered into personal communion with the living God. And what a difference that is. Than standing at the foot of a mountain where if you touched the mountain you would die. You understand that Jesus loves you and you are drawn to him by cords of love and you don't want to hurt the one that you love it's different people it's different well anyway uh, I sort of got off the subject there that, that was the first illustration and that was uh, my make-believe illustration uh, it ignores the context in other words those who would teach that are doing exactly the same thing that replacement theology does. They were making the passage teach the exact opposite of what it actually teaches. And that's what the replacement theology does. In claiming that the Bible teaches that Israel is the church and that the church is Israel, they are making the Bible teach exactly the opposite of what the author intended. And we saw the first major passage, which is Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, and they pull verse 6 right out of that context. And every place Paul talks about Israel in that passage, it's clear that he's talking about national Israel and that God has not cast away his people. Let me give you another example. This is a true one. It's not imaginary like the first example. This is from the radio ministry of a southern fundamentalist preacher in the 1950s. He was arguing that women should never wear their hair up on top of their head in a bun. Did you know that was a big deal back in the 50s? He said that a closer examination of the text had a hidden meaning that any woman who wore her hair in a top knot was disobeying Jesus. Did you know that? All of you who at one time or another wore a top knot. <laughs> Do you remember top knots? Remember those? Yeah, okay. Hey, my wife actually still wore top knots because she had long hair. You know, you remember her. And she wore those beautiful top knots and sometimes they were braided, you know, that she twist around on the top and sometimes on the side. And I loved her hair. Anyway, so he said they were disobeying Jesus. Now, by the way, watch out for people who say the text has a hidden meaning that only they know. There's a lot of uh, stuff out there right now about the harbinger and other things like that, all these secret meanings that, you know, hey, it's up to me to let you know what this means. No. You have the indwelling Holy Spirit. You can understand this. You may need someone to help you understand that, but you can see it yourself in the text. God has given you the Spirit of God who indwells you if you are a believer, and he has given the gift of teacher and pastor teacher so that we might expound those things to you, but you will sense by the Spirit of God as you read the text, not make up some hidden meaning in the text. So, you know the verse that he used? Matthew chapter 24 verse 17 here's the verse he said now you women who are wearing those top knots you're disobeying a command of Jesus because here's a command that Jesus gave let him which is upon the house top knot come down to take anything out of his house you see Jesus said top knot come down <laughs> I'm not making that up <laughs> is that what the text says 
No, that is not what the text said. You see, he said, Jesus explicitly said, top not come down. Now look, when we looked at Romans chapter 9, the first five verses that precede the verse that replacement theology rips out of its context, makes it specifically clear that Paul is talking about real Jews when he uses the term Israel. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Now, was Paul Chinese? No. Was he from uh, southern Peru? No. He was a Jew. In fact, he makes that very clear. Who are Israelites? There we've got Israel. Those are his kinsmen according to the flesh. To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. In case you don't know who they are, here are a few identifying factors that might connect you to some passages in the Old Testament that talk about the Jews. Whose are the fathers, and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came? Was Jesus Jewish? Yes? Yes, okay. Who is over all God, blessed forever? He's also God. Amen. And then the verse that they rip out of context. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Now does that say Israel is the church, or does that say that there are Jews who have not trusted in their Messiah? They are not all Israel, which are of Israel. It excludes, it limits, it doesn't expand, it cuts back and limits. Then he makes the point in the next verse that being a physical descendant of Abraham is not enough either, because I talked about, you remember, Hagar and Keturah and the concubines that Sarah, uh, Abraham had after Sarah. Neither because they are seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. There's only one group that fits into that Jewish context of Israel. He goes on, he, that doesn't make the church Israel, or Israel the church. He goes on and talks about a promise that is going to be given. It's come through Sarah, then it's going to come through Rebekah, and it's going to be Jacob, not Esau. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, verse 13. That's the foundation for God later calling it Gentiles as the same separate group upon whom he could pour out his mercy on the basis of faith. You know, if it were only on the basis of being physically related to Abraham, most of us here wouldn't stand a chance. God worked his plan through Israel so that at their rejection he could open the door to Gentiles on the basis of faith. Faith that's like the faith that Abraham had. And that's what Paul goes on here in the chapter to say. We're not going to read all of that again. That brought us to the second key principle that re uh, ref remnant, excuse me, that replacement theologians tend to ignore in the passage. And that key principle, which is stated in many places in the Bible, is the remnant principle. That gets us down to verse 27. I'm just ripping through real quickly to summarize because these principles I'm going to talk about them when we get to the next big passage that the replacement theologians use. Verse 27, Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel. Okay, Israel. We're talking Israel here, okay? Not the church. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Now you can apply that to the church. Though the church be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of the church will be saved. Oh, all the rest of you guys lose your, th uh, your salvation. But what we're going to keep out a remnant, there'll be a few of you that we keep. No, that's talking about Israel. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, here's the remnant principle again, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodoma, and had been made like unto Gomorrah. They were totally annihilated. But God kept out a remnant, a seed. That brought us to the conclusion that I stated just a moment ago. God includes men in his blessing who are men of faith, not merely descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the twelve tribes. And you know, to that conclusion, most theologians, or replacement theologians, would agree. They'll get down to the end of the passage and say, yes, we agree with that. God is calling out, by faith, people unto himself. But in the course of that mix, they say that God no longer has promises for national Israel, which ignores the context of Romans 9, 10, and 11. I mean, they come to the right conclusion that God is calling out a people to himself, and they are his by faith. But in saying that, they say, therefore God no longer has promises to Israel. That's not Paul's argument in the chapter. That's making the chapter turn on its head. All three chapters turn on their heads as to what the author intended to say. So, 
We asked last week, when Paul gets to chapter 10, do you think he's referring to, when he uses the term Israel, the Jews of the church? Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And we saw that is referring to national Israel. We read all the way through Romans chapter 11. Oh, my, there's so much in that chapter. God cast away his people. Remember what God said? He was going to make them his people back there in Exodus. That's what we just read this morning in Exodus chapter 6, uh, verses uh, 6 and 7, 7 and 8. His people. Has God cast away his people? For I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Definite statement, he has not cast them away. Elijah makes intercession to God against Israel. He talks about all the bad things they've done. God says, remnant principle. I've got 7,000 men who've not bowed the knee to Baal. Verse 5. So then, at this present time, there's also a remnant according to the election of grace. A remnant of whom? What's your context? Israel. God has kept out a remnant. Verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. Romans, verse 8. God has given them, not us, he's given them the spirit of slumber, not the church. He's given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear until this day. We get down to verse 11. I say then, have they, contrasted with us, not us, have we stumbled? No. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. Down a little bit further here. How much more their fullness, there's your remnant principle again. Uh, if by any means I provoke them, verse 14, to emulation, them which are my flesh, who were his flesh, he told you in chapter 9, they're Jews. Seed of Abraham, tribe of Benjamin. Save some of them, remnant principle. That's still verse 14. Verse 15, if the casting away be the reconciling of the word, what shall be the receiving of them be but life from the dead? There's a future for the remnant of Israel. Do you see, this is Paul's argument. I may be beating a dead horse here. Everybody says, yeah, yeah, we understand that. We, we believe that 100%. Go on, Pastor Spencer. Get out of Romans chapter 11. Okay. <laughs> Dear people, if God moved the Apostle Paul in one of the most important books in the New Testament to spend three chapters on this issue, three full chapters on this issue, do you not think that it is important for God? Do you not think that it is important for the church? Romans! 9, 10, 11. You cannot take this and stand it on its head and make it mean the opposite of what it says that it will mean. Down farther, we find the faith principle. Verse 20, thou standest by faith. We find the principle of the natural branches and the branches that have been grafted in. Cutting off from blessing. Not cutting off from unconditional covenants. Otherwise God can cut us, cut us off from the unconditional covenant of salvation that he's given to us. And verse 23, and they also, they, not us, they also, if they bide still not in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Jumping down to verse 25, blindness in part has happened to Israel. What's the context? National Jews. He hasn't stopped talking about Israel. Verse 26, and so all Israel shall be saved. There is coming a day when every Jew left alive on the face of the earth will turn to Christ. Hasn't happened yet, but God guarantees it will happen at the end of the tribulation. They should come out of Sion, S-I-O-N, that's Zion. Where is Zion? Zion is the mountain in Jerusalem where the great king reigned and will reign. Shall turn away in godliness from Jacob. What is Jacob's other name? Israel. Are we talking literal or are we talking figurative here? For this is my covenant unto them. We've been looking at covenant back here in the book of Exodus where God promises these things to Israel. When I shall take away their sins. Not when he takes away our sins, when he takes away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake, for the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Do you think God is going to repent of what he said back there in that text that we just read where seven, eight times he says, I will, I will, I will, I will. This God can say, well, I, I guess, uh, you know, this is a bad, this is a failed experiment. I guess I'll throw that one away. I don't think so. God will accomplish his purposes. Okay, that brings us to today. Let's look at more examples of how Paul uses the term Israel to see if our interpretation of Romans 9 through 11 
is consistent with the rest of Scripture. Remember, that's the second principle I gave you. Not only look at the immediate context, but look at the rest of Scripture to see if it fits the pattern of the rest of Scripture. So, that's an important principle of hermeneutics, the science of biblical interpretation. Scripture interprets Scripture. Scripture never disagrees with itself. So, how else does Paul use the term Israel in the New Testament? By the way, as we saw, there are many different usages of that word Israel or Israelites in the New Testament. Almost all of them are in the writings of the Apostle Paul. So how does Paul use the term Israel? Number one, he uses it as the Jews, not the church, because they were the ones who ate of the sacrifices. 1 Corinthians 10.18 Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the altar. We eat a memorial. We don't eat a sacrifice. The Romans Catholics think they're eating a sacrifice. When the, they have their communion, their mass, what does the priest do? He stands up in the front, he elevates the host, which is the goblet with the wine in it, and this big flat wafer on top of it with a cloth over the top of it. That's called the host, because Christ is the host of the table. You know, somebody invites you over to dinner, they're the host. Okay? So, here we've got the table. And here is the host. This is Jesus to them. And as... The priest says the words of the Mass, we offer unto you the only true and living God. At the instant that he says those words, that wine is turned into the blood of Christ. It seems the same in substance, but it is transubstantiated. It is changed into the blood of Christ. And that wafer, though it is the same apparently in its appearance, has been changed in its substance to where it is the body of Christ. We offer unto you the only true and living God. That's a sacrifice. They're offering the sacrifice of Christ countless times all around the world, 24 hours a day as the time zones changes and as the priest elevates the host and he brings it up to them. People, the book of Hebrews tells us three times that Christ offered one sacrifice for sins forever. That sacrifice is not repeated when we take the Lord's table. It is a memorial of the once and for all finished sacrifice of Christ. Israel cannot mean the church here in this passage. 1 Corinthians 10, 18, Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the altar. Here's another example of how Paul uses Israel. Remember? Now, some of us don't like to think in these terms, but I'm putting it in the context of New Testament scripture. The law was abolished. You say, does the Bible really say that? Yes, it does. I'll read it to you in a minute. You're not under the law, you're under grace. Your motivation is not Mount Sinai, your motivation is relationship to Christ through the indwelling Holy Spirit. It just grieves me when I read, particularly in some of the more, quote, reformed circles, where they try to put you back under the law because they view Israel as the church. You see, if Israel is the church, that puts you back under the law. And so if you get confused on that issue, it has some very practical implications about what you're going to do in terms of how you try to live the Christian life. If you are Israel, you're back under the law. Oh, people. All theology is connected. When you get off track a little bit here at this point, you're going to be way off track by the time you get out into outer space. Imagine a rocket going off from Cape Canaveral and it's only one degree off, you know, as it takes off its trajectory and, and the, the gyroscopes don't bring it back onto its correct path. It simply follows that same trajectory and it's supposed to reach the moon. Is it going to reach the moon? One degree off down here? By the time it gets out there, it's going to be way, way, way outside the orbit of the moon. Understand that there are certain basic principles of theology that if you get it wrong at the foundation, you will not hit the target. You'll find yourself out in Lululand somewhere. You don't want to be there. There's a very important basic principle. If Israel is the church, to Israel was given the law. Now, the law still has a good purpose. But remember what Paul says to Timothy. The law was not made for a righteous man, but for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers, for murders of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them to defile themselves with mankind. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, yes, the law has a purpose, but it wasn't given to guide the Christian life. It's made for 
the ungodly, the unrighteous, the murders of fathers, the murders of mothers, whoremongers, homosexuals. I mean, the law does state God has standards. And the law condemns. It does not save, it does not sanctify, it does not guide you for life. Jesus Christ and your relationship to him, Christ fulfilled the law. Now you're related to him. Not by your works, you're related to him by grace. It's not by fear that you are motivated, it's by faith and love. Which as you understand your relationship to Christ, oh how I loved my wife. And how many things I put up with. And she put up with me because she loved me. And we did those things not because there was a rule book written someplace that said, you must wash the dishes after every meal. You must do the laundry uh, after one week of laundry in the laundry hamper. We do not want the house to stink. <laughs> you know? Didn't have to have that. Because we loved each other. We learned to work together. We learned to do those things that pleased the other. We showed what's called, and it's been forgotten in our society today, we showed what's called deference. That means putting up with the other person in such a way that you flex and bend your own will, your own desires, your own dominant personality, and both of us had dominant personalities. You bend it because you love somebody. Too, many, too few Christian families have that anymore. Well, quit meddling and get back to preaching. Okay. Uh, what does the scripture say about that? Let's talk about the law for just a second, which is not your motivation, it's Christ. You are not Israel, which is one of the reasons why you are not under the law. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 3.7 but if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stone. Now, what was written and engraven in stone? Does anybody remember anything in the Old Testament where, where something was written and graven, that is, carved into stone? Two, two stone tablets. Anybody know what that's called? Ten Commandments. Okay. It calls it the ministration of exuberant life. Is that what it said? What did it say it was? If the ministration of death. This is 2 Corinthians 3 7. I'm not making this up. What does it call the Ten Commandments? The ministration of death. Now, I'm not an antinomian. Nine of the Ten Commandments are restated in the New Testament. Nine of them are restated in the New Testament, but in the New Testament, not one of them is based upon Sinai. That's important. Instead, they're based on your new relationship with Christ. In fact, when Jesus interprets them, he shows how much more extensive they are than the mere external shell that Israel was focused on. When Paul restates them, he shows how much deeper they go than the externals that everybody focuses on when they look at Deuteronomy chapter 5 or Exodus chapter 20, which is the two places that those Ten Commandments are listed. For example, Paul says, Let him that stole steal no more. Okay, that parallels thou shalt not steal, right? But Paul doesn't stop there. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands that he may have to give to him that needeth. Not only don't steal, but if you're stealing already, stop stealing, and then start working. And when you work, then you have something not to hoard for yourself, then you have something to give. Does that go a little farther than... Deuteronomy chapter 5 and Exodus chapter 20, I think it does. You know, just don't, just not a matter of don't steal, but work. Work so that you can give. Jesus said, Thou shalt, thou, you've heard that it said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. He said, um, I say unto you, anybody who looks after a woman with lust in his heart has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Is that a little farther down the road? then simply the command, thou shalt not commit adultery? I think so. 
and these things are based on your relationship to Christ. I'm not going to spend my time on that. Look, the time is almost up. i got to get through this, this sermon. <laughs> i got all these other sermons out here that are hanging on the edge. All right. <laughs> There's a kind of, let me finish reading that passage. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stone, was glorious, so that the children of Israel, is that Jews or is that the church? So that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly behold the face of Moses. Have you ever seen Moses? No. For the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Remember Moses put a veil over his face? We'll read that in a second here. Because he didn't want the children of Israel seeing that this was a, it was glorious. Yeah, whoa, look at that. Moses is shining. Is he on fire? What's with Moses? But he put a veil over his face so they wouldn't see the glory fading in the ministration of death. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look. Now here it is could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. How can you state it any more clearly than that? We see it in the contrast between law and grace. There are a lot of passages on this. I'm just going to run through a few of them. John 1.17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean there was no grace in the Old Testament? No, that's not what it means. Does it mean there's no truth in the Old Testament? No, that's not what it means. Does that mean there are no standards in the New Testament? No, that's not what it means. But it's showing you a contrast between that which motivates you and that which empowers you and that by which you can live the Christian life versus that which you will always fail. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. We find the faith grace principle that we just looked at contrasted with the law. Romans chapter 4. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, that's the national Jews which are under the law, but to them also which is of the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all. Romans chapter 5 verse 20. Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Grace is stronger than law. Romans 6, 14 and 15. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. In other words, the fact that we're not under the law is not the right to antinomianism. It's not the right to live an immoral life. It's not the right to, to do all the wicked things that your heart desires to do. Remember the issue of balance? Balancing the Christian life so that you don't fall into the horrors of legalism and wearing yourself out, or the horrors of antinomianism where you're living like the worst pagan in the world. There's a balance in the middle, and it's because of your relationship to Christ, your love for Christ. You're keeping your eyes by faith on Jesus who loved you and gave himself for you. What a different motivation to doing what is right. We see the total inability of the law to be the guiding principle of the Christian life. Galatians 2.21 I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Did you know you can't get one iota of righteousness from the law? You can't. If you could, Christ is dead in vain. You're related to Jesus, dear people! You're not related to Sinai. You're related to life, not to the ministration of death. Galatians 5, 4. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Oh my, I wish we had time to talk about the book of Galatians. I did give you three chapters in Romans, but I'm not going to go all the way through Galatians right now. That's a very important book on this subject. Now, that brings us to the second big passage used by the replacement theologians. What about the Israel of God? Because that's in Galatians. First one is in that big, big powerhouse of Romans. Second one is the big powerhouse of Galatians, where Paul is arguing against the legalists. That's the book of Romans, and that's the book of Galatians. Galatians 6.16 And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy. Now, here's the big phrase. And upon the Israel of God. Oh, that must mean the church is Israel, right? Is that what it said? When you read the phrase, do you taking it at face value unless somebody tells you that's what it means? Does that phrase say that? Does it say the church is Israel? 
Or does it say, as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy, and upon the Israel of God? No. He's using it exactly the same way Paul used the term Israel back in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Remember the remnant principle? It does not say that Israel is the church. Paul makes it clear that being Jewish is not what saves you. That's very clear. Uh, Israel is the Jews. Over in Philippians, for example, though I might, this Philippians 3, beginning in verse 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might keep trust in the flesh, I more. Now listen, this is strict Jewish here. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Clearly the church is different from Israel there. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Ah, a relationship overpowered the law. A relationship overpowered his heritage through Benjamin and Abraham. What things were gained to me? Those were the things I was proud about. I did all that stuff. Man, you couldn't call you couldn't find a more Jewish Jew than Paul. What things were gained to me? Those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. I spent Thanksgiving with uh, Evangeline and Jorge and my daughter Netanya came down from Boston, Massachusetts. And Evangeline had also invited over two fellows from their church. One is a fellow from Peru who married a girl from Spain who knew Jorge back when they were in college, and that was where the connection came. His wife and uh, two little children, uh, like a two-year-old and a six-month-old, are still down in uh, Peru, or I guess they're over in Spain. They went to Spain for a while. Uh, they, um, they'll be coming to the States soon, as soon as the husband, whose name is Carlos, uh, has the opportunity of getting an apartment for them. And so... Though that guy and another man in the church who does a lot of help for the church but had no place to go for Thanksgiving then invited those two men over. Very nice. So those guys were both interested in what my brother does in terms of making films. And um, so we sat down and we went on the internet and we found a bunch of places where my brother Peter was receiving various rewards awards for the film that he had produced. I mean he's won a number of film festivals and things like that. And um, in one of those where he's giving his acceptance speech, he brings to mind, to the audience, the parable of the treasure hidden in the field. Your call, man's out there plowing, he's a workman, and he finds a, a treasure in the field. And most of us would say, whoa, baby, this is my day. <laughs> you take the treasure, you put it under your robe, go, I think most of you would do that, right? I would be tempted. But since I know the meaning of the parable, I wouldn't. <laughs> so, he says, most of us would do that. We'd put it in our pocket, and we'd go off, we'd run to town, you know, we would immediately quit working for whoever we'd been working for, and then we would just spend it however we wanted for the rest of our life. Man, oh, the old covetous bug begins to work in us, you know, treasure, treasure. Have you ever gone treasure hunting? When you were a kid, did you go treasure hunting? Okay. But he says the guy doesn't do that. Instead, the guy buries it back in the field. And then he goes, and he's just a common laborer. And it says he takes everything that he owned and sold it so he could buy that field. Because he knew that the treasure belonged to whoever owned the field. And Peter's point was, when you think about Jesus, are you willing to sell everything that you own to get the treasure? See, Jesus is the treasure. Are you willing to give it up all so you can have Jesus? He's more to you than anything that you can imagine. Think of what you love most. Think of what is most valuable to you. Are you willing to give it up for Jesus? If you had to, would you give it up for Jesus? That's what Paul's saying here. 
Okay, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith dear people I want to be where Paul is not at the foot of Mount Sinai where there's a fence where I have to run away because of the thunder and the lightning and the noise and the sound of a trumpet and if so much as a beast touches the mountain it should be thrust through with a dart I want to be where Paul is desiring Christ with all my heart is that where you want to be? I hope so that brings us to the very important doctrine of the New Covenant and how it applies to us. Because they say, well, then the New Covenant, that's, that's, the, that's the doctrine that means that Israel is the church. I didn't get there. Okay, the important doctrine of the New Covenant, what it is, how it applies to us. How have we entered into the benefits? Does that entering into the benefits of the New Covenant? Because God promised the New Covenant in Jeremiah chapter 33. Does entering into the benefits of the New Covenant and it does apply to the church. The book of Hebrews talks about the new covenant. Does that make us Israel? Well, we'll have to save that for next week. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word and for its power. It's a beautiful word. It's a word that gives us hope and gladness and joy and peace. It's a word that gives us thanksgiving. It's a word that makes us understand that we are precious in your sight that we who are outside all of the promises that you gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that when Israel fell, that was your plan to be able to bring us as Gentiles into the great and wonderful blessings through faith in Christ. It doesn't make us Israel, but it does make us special. It doesn't mean that the church now takes over everything and Israel is no longer any future promises. It simply means that we who had no promises now have promises, now have relationship, now have blessing, not because of the law, but because of grace. Oh, Father, we didn't deserve it, and that's what grace is all about. We didn't deserve it, but you have given it to us through faith in your only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn for this morning is number 255, another one of the uh, expectancy hymns for Advent, which is Lo, How a Rosy.